Thank you guys so much for what you do serving us. So sweet to worship together. Amen. Amen. That's right. I feel like after Tara read that verse, we could just like, all right, we're done. Go home, everyone. Amen. So good. And while we have other things to say, we will be mainly staying there. Or that'll be a large part of what we're talking about. But again, we just want to say good morning and welcome to the Well Church. It was great. It was so fun being outside with you guys uh, last week for Celebration Sunday. Whoop, whoop. The weather was lovely. And we got to just remember the Lord's faithfulness to us through the ordinances and just fun and fellowship and food trucks together. Everyone loves those good Fs. And it is also refreshingly good, though, to be here in our regular kind of flow on Sunday mornings in our same uh, space. It's sweet. Well, for those of you, I see some new faces. For those I haven't met, again, yeah, my name's Sean. Um, I am our family ministry leader, I'm serving uh, well kids and elementary and students. Birth through high, whoop, whoop. Super fun. And all but about two or three Sundays um, a year, I'll be, you can find me over there uh, next to my wife, Riley, in the back. We like to sit in one spot. I don't know if you guys do that, but we usually hunker around the same area. Uh, we have uh, three kids, one of whom is still cooking and on the way, uh, the second of which bent my glasses, which is why I keep fixing them, <laughs> and the third of which just turned three today, so she's in the older well kids room. What up? Happy birthday, Queenie Boo Boo. Shout out. All right. <laughs> You all have nicknames for your kids, too. I know you do. All right. Well, for the past month or so, uh, we have been comparing uh, the pleasures or joys of knowing Jesus and belonging to him uh, with the lesser pleasures or hopes or comforts of this world in a series that we call Better Than. Hey, look, it says it right there for you to see. We've been looking at some common uh, idols, the things or people which we all run to uh, apart from God to find meaning or purpose or significance or acceptance. Because if we're honest, uh, and if the Bible is true, we all turn to these lesser things. We all turn uh, to those things that cannot deliver what they were never designed to deliver. And now our hope in looking at these isn't just to analyze or better understand you know, our idols or our idolatry, but uh, no, our hope is that we would all undergo real life change uh, from the Lord. Uh, that by beholding the glory of God, and by believing the saving work of Jesus that he's finished for us on the cross, uh, our affections for those lesser things actually would decrease, and that our love for him and our enjoyment of Christ would increase, Lord, less of us and more of you. Uh, that is what we want. And so week one, uh, Tyler kicked things off talking about how Jesus is better than pleasure, or really any other joy that can be found apart from God, or as the author of Ecclesiastes says, under the sun down here. And then we talked about accomplishments, all the stuff that we can do or achieve in our extremely limited time or resources here, uh, rather than just uh, abiding in the finished work of Jesus for us. And week three, Terrell uh, showed us how Jesus is better than love, the affection and acceptance we could gain uh, from other people. Uh, it's not wrong to want that, uh, but those people, unlike Jesus, will never fully satisfy our souls. That's too much pressure. And then two weeks ago, before Celebration Sunday, we talked about how Jesus is better than our illusion of control. I love that, because it's like, what are you talking about? Yes, it's an illusion. Uh, and any fear or anxiety that follows that, instead of finding true peace and freedom uh, in the sovereign God who cares for us. He really does. And then when I looked at what we were going to be studying today on the calendar, uh, I was a little thrown off, admittedly. I was like, okay, and you might be too, because it didn't sound immediately applicable to me. But you know how that goes. It's like, well, that's surely not, Lord. Uh, and then... But yes, uh, when I would always consider one of my four like root idols, one of the deeper ones, maybe comfort uh, or acceptance, uh, the more I thought about this and prayed about it, the more the Spirit really did show me how I could relate. And I hope he does that for you too. Uh, because today my goal is to show you from the scriptures uh, that Jesus is better than power. That's right. Uh, Jesus is better than power. And so I have a fun few pictures I'd like to show you because... I don't know if you're anything like me, but I thought I didn't think of what I thought about when I first thought about power. When that word was said, I might have thought of something more like this. I got a lot of pictures. It'll be fun. Aha! Thanos, the mad titan with all the infinity stones, alas. Uh, but maybe that's just because I'm an extreme fake comic book nerd. Um, <laughs> Or perhaps you were raised in the early 90s, and this image might look more familiar to you. Uh, Aladdin's genie, uh, played by Robin Williams, whose innate magical powers gained, or gave him phenomenal cosmic power. But what was the catch, you remember? Eedy, weedy, space, that's right. <laughs> I thought that'd be fun to, to share together. 
Or uh, perhaps if your mind predates uh, being discipled by Disney Plus and you thought about something more practical or more real world or realistic, uh, maybe you thought about the power or influence you can get or gain or control uh, through money, uh, through being inordinately wealthy. Uh, I hope that's what Jeff Bezos looks like. I don't actually know. <laughs> the internet told me so. Um, or uh, perhaps you thought of institutional power and authority like being CEO of your company or the President of the United States. And so I chose a few just to make it a fair spread. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ryan will be talking about politics, not me, okay? <laughs> or maybe your mind went to raw physical power because you are oddly one of those people who loves to diet and exercise. Uh, you like to pump iron and flip tractor tires and swing those rope thingies, <laughs> you know? Uh, I don't even know what they're called. Ask the McMains. Um, they love it, I'm sure. I'm, I don't know, but I assume. Or lastly, uh, perhaps your imagination or your physical stature agreed more with the former Lord Chancellor of France, Francis Bacon, who said that knowledge is power. Thank you for that, Francis, and what we know versus what others don't know. Uh, and thank you, Internet, for providing me with this one image repeatedly when I was looking for a quote of Francis Bacon. Uh, <laughs> That is the country of France as bacon. <laughs> France is bacon. So, oh, the wonderful things you can find when trying to study more about the Lord. <laughs> it's great. Uh, well, whatever came to your mind when you thought of the word power or that Jesus is better than power, I think we can all agree that we have some measure of power or authority or influence, great or small, and we all have a desire uh, to do something with it. We want others... Um, we want to use our power to shape or influence the world around us and the people too. We want our existence to mean something, to leave a legacy or an imprint if we can, to have an effect on the people and places around us, to bring everything that we have and are to bear uh, on the world. And that's good because as people made in the image of God, we have been given incredible responsibility uh, and dominion, a playground authority over which um, to rule under the Lord together. But my question for you this morning is, do we use uh, the power, the influence, the opportunity we have been given uh, over the world and the people around us uh, for the glory of God uh, and the good of those other people? Or inversely, do we use it primarily to benefit ourselves, receiving glory uh, from creation and others that God simply will not share? So that's going to be real fun to talk about. Uh, but we all fall prey in these ways. And Another small way you could say it is, in short, uh, whose kingdom are you building uh, with that power? We are either in the surf, service and usage, or the service or the usage of other image bearers and citizens around us. Uh, do we see ourselves at the top with everyone else at our service, or are we in the service of God and everyone else? So we have. Uh, We've been looking at this in a few ways. We've compiled some of the work uh, that Dick Kaufman, Dick Keyes, and some of the leaders of Soma Church have been kind of studying about these idols. And I want to show some to you now. We're going to look at how this idol works at a functional level, and then we'll open up the scriptures just to marvel at the greatness and power of Jesus. So let's start by saying with the person who struggles uh, with the idol of power, uh, this is their firmly held belief. Uh, that life only has meaning and that I only have purpose if I have power and influ influence over others. Uh, it speaks not just uh, to the power and ability to control our circumstances uh, or the world around us. I know that was partially from last week in control. Uh, but as we'll talk about today, I think it's helpful to think of leadership as, or influence, uh, to more than power, influence. And a lot of people just said that leadership, that's all it is, is leadership is just your influence on others. Uh, maybe even that prideful uh, collection of resources and respect, sure, that's the standard form of power, but also the influence and effect and control we have over other people and how much we enjoy that. Uh, when it's not wrong, obviously, to want uh, to affect or influence others. That's actually really good. Uh, what this idol is getting at, I think, is the pride that comes with enjoying our influence, uh, entertaining any notion of superiority because of our power, or our own self-made illusions of grandeur, perhaps. Maybe instead of an illusion of control, it's an illusion of grandeur. And the person given to this idol seeks a few things. Uh, they seek, obviously, power and influence, uh, but they also uh, positions of authority, uh, respect, status, um, winning, hashtag winning, uh, and, or just followers in general. And I think that's especially applicable uh, online. 
People with this idol struggle uh, with being vain or prideful or entitled or controlling. I uh, loved hyper competitive and not just uh, or overly ambitious, but not in the godly ambition sort of way. And they want to use uh, their power and influence over others, not alongside others. Um, so we can find if our heart is seeking these things, if we are willing to do whatever it takes, uh, right or wrong, to be the best at blank, the most blank, uh, so that everyone else is looking up at us. Ah. And all the while, I think every, uh, every sin comes from some form of unbelief. So the key unbelief here is that God, uh, we, we do not believe that God is glorious, so that we don't have to be or look elsewhere. Uh, we all fail to believe that God is most great, that he alone is awesome and wonderful, that he is worthy of worship and not us. And at times, if we're honest, uh, we all believe that belonging to God, uh, you know, unworthy as we are, or just participating in his work in the world isn't going to be enough to satisfy us. So we indulge ourselves or, um, in other lesser side projects, uh, and we promote our own brand. We forget how much... Uh, God loves us, not because we are something special, like Ryan said, but because uh, he is, and that he would show mercy to us. Uh, and the issue here is primarily about glory and who we think deserves it the most. All right. Now, all of these uh, idols we've been talking about uh, have some sort of price to pay. Obviously, they're never good. Uh, as we tell our toddler, every time we disobey, there's some form of loss. Um, and these idols are not our friends. One of the ways we can tell if we're paying the cost uh, to gain more power is if we are willing to be burdened or to take on too much responsibility. Everyone who struggles with commitments knows. Uh, the cost here is actually ourselves. In our overreaching uh, for power uh, and attempts to maintain, too, or attempts to yeah, maintain too much of it, we choose not to live within God's good and right limits uh, he's given us only then to quickly find out that we're not godlike in our capacity or control or limits. Uh, we take on more responsibility than we can uh, handle, uh, and often graciously the Lord allows us to break in that. Uh, but we need to be honest with ourselves and before the Lord about the desires and motivations creating our commitments, especially the self-made ones. Uh, and I'm the first to say I'm really bad at this. Uh, well, it might seem godly or sacrificial to say yes and sure to all the opportunities that come your way. Or like, yeah, let's start playing Dungeons and Dragons at a local shop to make relationships for Jesus. And maybe he'll save some people. It'll be great. I, I have time for that. That's oddly specific, right? But it's happening. <laughs> and I've prayed about it. I'm doing better. Keep asking me about it. All right. Uh, but it does take a deep security in the gospel and in the love of Jesus to say no uh, to opportunities that scratch that itch uh, to bring us glory. Um, specialness, especially when they're shrouded by good things like family and life and friends and work, uh, gospel opportunities. And while you might think it's super funny uh, that mine is D&D, because that's super nerdy, uh, I think that goes to show really anything that we have or do uh, to feel competent or knowledgeable or likable uh, can turn on us in entertainment, work, uh, theology, hobbies, uh, exercise, and however much you're willing to pay or whatever, uh, wherever you go to find a sense of meaning or specialness, uh, there's never really freedom. Uh, there's always some form of fear. And for the person struggling uh, with this idol, their ultimate fear is humiliation. Ooh. Ah. We can sense if we're becoming power hungry uh, and that it has us when we don't want to be found out for what we really are. We are broken. We are weak. Uh, we are dependent. Uh, just like everyone else. Even though the scriptures say that's the only kind of person there is and the only kind of person the Lord loves. Uh, and th I think this actually was the saddest part of my kind of preparation time, that our only hope uh, for salvation or sanctification really begins with this posture, the thing we fear most, humility. Uh, oh, it hurts. When we say, no, God... Um, no other people. I've got this. I can do this. I don't want to be seen as weak or needy or dependent. I would never uh, do a task so menial or talk to people like that because they would bring me down socially. I am something great. I have to be. And something must be. Um, and the worst part is it's not just uh, negative for us. It's bad for other people, too. Uh, our refusal to be humiliated uh, makes others feel uh, used and undervalued 
exhausted or small in our efforts to gain power. Uh, because God did not give us the grace of community with one another just so we could use each other or consume each other in our own vanity. Right. Yeah. And this delusion that we can be better uh, or more deserving than other people, that God made and cares about deeply, uh, when we do that, they are sacrificed on the altar of our success or left to the wayside. Uh, and we forget that the image of God is we and it's not me. When we're willing to do whatever it takes to gain uh, power or influence or greatness, we end up consuming our brothers and sisters, our children and spouses or friends. Uh, we treat them like the stairs that were built for us to go up. And that is not the picture of Trinitarian fellowship we are called to reflect. Hmm. All right. Finally, and most noticeably, I think, in my own parenting life, we should start wondering if the idols have, of power has begun to take root, if our problem emotion becomes anger. Uh, when we bow up or when we blow up, uh, when, when people won't stay under our thumb or under our influence or listen to our voice like it's the very voice of God. <laughs> you must clean up this playroom. I'm your father. Uh, that's uh, someone else's personal example. Yeah. Uh, when we get so angry because we've attached our identity to the thing or person that makes us uh, feel powerful, then when they're gone or we feel that that power is slipping away from us. We get bigger, we get louder, uh, we're more controlling because on the inside we really feel powerless. We feel small. We're not feeling in control anymore. And it's scary. It's vulnerable and we don't know what else to do but try to assert more of our strength. So I think the scriptures would be clear that we've all misused or abused the power that God has given us and we've entertained this false sense of greatness in some small way. Uh, and that's why Jesus came. And that is why he is better than any power or influence we ever could have over other people. Because, as our scripture said, even though Jesus is God, who rightly deserves all glory and honor, uh, he used his power to selflessly serve and pardon you and me. Uh, thieves, the Bible says, thieves of his glory. So turn with me again, uh, if you're still there or if you're on your device, to Philippians 2, uh, verses 6 through 11. I would just love to read it. And we're going to look at the humility and the love and the service of our great Savior. So let's pick that up. All right. We are going to compare the mindset of um, being better or greater than other people uh, and just see how false that is and what Jesus did instead. It says here in Philippians 2, let's start it off in verse 6. Philippians 2, 6, 6 says, Who, though he was Jesus in the form of God, did not account, uh, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped uh, or literally uh, taken. Even though he was the uh, radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, he emptied himself, it says, uh, by taking the form of a servant servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled, or literally, the word is humiliated himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which was humiliating. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, uh, the greatest name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I feel like we could just read that a few times and that would be really good. But our main point today, we're still going to try and make some sense out of this and out of ourselves and out of our struggles uh, with idolatry. And our main point this morning, if you are a note taker, we're going to have five after that. Main point, five, break it down. We're going to talk about that better than any false greatness uh, that comes with lording our power over others or accumulating it. True greatness is found in the loving the humble work and person of Jesus. Let me read that again. Better than any false greatness that comes with our, uh, we come with lording our power over others, true greatness is found uh, in loving the humble work and person of Jesus. Amen. Whew, here we go. Finally, uh, 
well, let's talk about, well, let's start by talking about false greatness. False greatness comes from the belief uh, that we really are better uh, than other people because of our power or what God's given us, uh, that we're stronger uh, and smarter and wealthier and more important or attractive. And it is actually false that we're better because that's just not true. Some of those other things might be true, but uh, we are not actually better. We are made equally in the image of God. We have um, equally fallen short of the glory of God, as Romans 3, 23 says. And therefore, we all equally need uh, grace and mercy from God. And you may know the old adage, what is it? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's an oldie but a goodie. So if you are feeling proud, perhaps, um, of the role or respect you've fought so hard to achieve at others or over others at work, I think we need to be reminded that any position of authority or influence we've had uh, has been given uh, to us. So my first point, I think it's logical and maybe too overly simple, but I think it's good to remember in this case, who's is who's, uh, that any power or influence we have has been given to us by God. And the key word just being given. So when we are feeling particularly good or particularly proud of ourselves, what we've known or done, uh, we think we just need to remember uh, Romans 13, 1, where it says, uh, there is no authority except which that has God has established. Or uh, maybe we're feeling pretty good about yeah, what we know, what we've done. We could look at Daniel 2.21, where it says, He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. It's not us. It's not self-made. Or as Acts 17, 24-25 reminds us, uh, the God who made the world and everything, and it being Lord of heaven and earth, He Himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So I was trying to find some more specific examples. Like, oh, everything. That's great. <laughs> it gives us everything. We did nothing uh, to earn our capacity to think or to move. Uh, we were born with health, and it's only God's mercy that keeps us that way, as anyone in the hospital knows. And uh, we didn't do anything to earn our financial or our social position that benefits us so. Uh, we were placed there with the gifts that God has given us to use them there. And it's only His mercy that keeps us there, as everyone who's lost uh, everything all at once knows. And if you have a house full of beautiful children to care for and to shape and enjoy, we should praise God uh, because we did nothing to deserve or create them. Uh, we did not keep the blood flowing in and out of their little veins when they were being knit together in secret, as anyone who has lost children knows. So everything we enjoy and everything we are is a gift uh, from God, not the result of anything particularly great about us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this is the true, uh, this is the same for our salvation, that for by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not of our own doing, it's the gift of God, so that no one could boast. And not just regarding our salvation, but as Christians, we also did nothing to uh, deserve our sanctification every degree since that. It's been grace, if you're still feeling a little bit too good about your maturity versus your younger brother uh, to the left or to the right. We can look at Paul, as he says, looking back on his full ministry life, which was awesome and better than ours. Uh, he can look back in 1 Corinthians 15 and say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. I did work harder than any of them. That's true. I was participating in a lot, though it was not I. It was the grace of God that was with me. So the notion, uh, perhaps, that we are or have or have done uh, something particularly great to deserve uh, someone else's allegiance or infatuation or respect is laid bare when we truly believe that everything that we have been given has been given to us by God. And that point number two, only God has total, complete, and perfect power. So... I like this kind of uh, also looking at, okay, why is, better Jesus, uh, why is Jesus better than power and influence? Well, the straight up answer is Jesus is power. <laughs> Jesus is God uh, at the simplest level. Uh, he is literally the source of everything. I probably wrote too much here because I was just like, God, this is so great. Uh, Jesus literally uh, spoke the sun uh, into burning existence, and it's been burning at 27 million degrees Fahrenheit ever since. Uh, Aristotle said, after all his thinking, he's like, whoever God is, he's the unmoved mover. He's the original influencer, hashtag. Uh, with regard to magnitude, uh, I'm pretty sure we all agree that Jesus is better or superior 
than any influence or power we could have because he is literally reconciling all things in the cosmos back to God. Whatever ministry work we think that we've participated in, it's not as good or as rich or as big as that. Uh, and I'm going to read Colossians 1 with you just to stand and offer a minute of the greatness and glory of Jesus. That It says here in Colossians 1 that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, uh, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones and dominions or rulers and authorities, that's angels and demons. All things were created through him and for him, Amen. not us. And he is before all things, before us, and in him all things hold together. I love that. Your chair, being held together by Jesus. Uh, the money in the bank that we feel so good about, being held together by Jesus, right. even digitally. I don't know how that works. Um, <laughs> The bodies that we so sculpt to bring others' attention to us being held together mercifully by Jesus. And it continues to say in verse 18 that Jesus is the head of the body of the church. Uh, he is holding this church together, not us. He is holding our home and our family members together. He is holding our work and our positions there together. In him, everything is held together by the word of his power. I think it just removes boasting for sure says that he is the firstborn uh, from the dead. Or the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. Death literally could not hold him, if we're trying to talk about that Jesus is better than power. Uh, so that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So Jesus is better than power because Jesus is God, and only God has total, complete, and perfect power. So fun to think about. Well, let's keep reading to see how the God-man chose to use this limitless power. Because that's really what's in it for us today. Was it to wipe away sinful humanity in a flood and to start again? Uh, he's done it before. He's entitled to it. We are his creatures made for his purposes. But no. God chose through him, uh, in Colossians 1.20, it goes on to say, through him, through Jesus, to reconcile, to bring back together to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven, he made peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. So before we get into the richness there and the same kind of humility and love and service that I think God would have for us as people, uh, let's just say, why was there not peace? What happened to heaven and earth, uh, to God and man that created this rift and this need for reconciliation? And we know the Sunday school answer is that sin separates us from God. Even though uh, Adam and Eve were given power, uh, from God to influence and to shape literally everything in creation, to rule and to have dominion as his royal representatives, uh, they reached for the only power that was not theirs. Uh, the power to decide what is good and what is not, for autonomy and to have influence over themselves, which only God had reserved. Uh, thus the world um, was broken, humanity separated from the presence of God. Uh, when the serpent told them they could be great like God, they could be like God when they already were in his image. To have ultimate power and influence instead of trusting the good and right power of God. They listened to the serpent. And it wasn't just Adam and Eve. We know this. We are all in Adam, as it says. We have all abused this power. Uh, and Romans 5, 12 says, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. We all have sinned. Like our first parents, and due to the corrupt natures we've inherited from them, the Bible teaches us that point number three, we have all used our power to love and serve ourselves. We don't have to look long into the mirror or to the biblical story to see that this is true. Uh, we could, there's, I, there's literally too many, but I cut it down to some, some basic covenantal points. Here we go. Abraham used his influence over his wife uh, to lie about who she is, and to cause incredible suffering for households of Egyptians just to save his own skin, even though God had already promised to bless him. Uh, Moses, who later freed God's people uh, from Egypt and worked miracle after miracle for the Israelites, assumed upon himself that, own, that great power that God had been working through him in his striking of the rock. I can do this. Uh, he did not rely on God, but internalized just for a moment that very power of God. David, perhaps the greatest or godliest of the kings of Israel before or after, used his influence, obviously we know, to sleep with another man's wife, to cover it up quietly, and to eventually kill poor Uriah with the Philistines, uh, even though Uriah was one of David's closest and mighty men. Um, you read the list, it's, he is one of his own loyal subjects. Maybe even a friend, the scriptures might say. 
And we know that James 3.17 says, where there is this envy and this selfish ambition, we find disorder and every evil practice messes with us. We've all used our, the power and influence that God has given us in some form, great or small, to love and serve ourselves. We have lied about whose power it is, and we have misrepresented God's character. But Jesus is better because he is the accurate picture of God. He did not listen to the serpent. He did not have envy or selfish ambition in his heart. Uh, he did not give in to any false sense of greatness from lording his power over others, so he's entitled to it. Instead, we see true greatness versus false greatness in the humble work and person of Jesus. Let's look at what he did. Point number four, Jesus used his power to love and serve others, and God, God and others. Jesus lived, or he used his ultimate power, let's start there, to become human. It says to empty himself of glory, to put on human flesh. He was born in a filthy stable, laid in an animal's dirty feeding trough. He was raised by an imperfect mother and father. He submitted to, I studied and memorized Torah. He wrote the thing. Uh, he worked hard. Uh, he sweat to provide for his family and community. He spent the first 30 years of his life in obscurity. Uh, and now, I don't have time for all this whole side rant, but I love this book and I want to commend it to you. Uh, in The Imperfect Pastor, uh, Zach Eswine says that, especially in regards to humility and our desire to be a part of something big and fast and important, we all want that. Uh, he says that almost anything in life that truly matters will require you to do something small and mostly overlooked for a long period of time. I thought that was so rich and sweet when we all want something more or greater. Uh, again, he says, if I'm bored with the ordinary people in ordinary places, then am I not bored with what God delights in? If I think that local limits of body and place are too small a thing for a person as gifted as I am, then don't I want to escape what God himself gladly and daily inhabits? If I stare at a face, a flower, a child, or a congregation, I say, but God, not this. I want to do something great for you. Am I not profoundly misunderstanding what God says is a great thing? Ooh, so fun. Jesus lived a humble human life, um, and he perfectly faced every temptation common to man uh, for the glory of God and for the good of us. As Hebrews 4, 15 says, we don't have a high priest who's unable uh, to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are yet without sin. And then in the climax of his redemptive history, Jesus performed the ultimate act of loving service, uh, not just for the righteous or the mighty, because there are none, uh, but for the weak and for needy sinners like you and me through his humiliating death on the cross. Romans 5, 6 to 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us. And this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And far better than any false greatness we could find that comes with lording our power over the others, we see true greatness in Jesus' definition of greatness that he hands to James and John in this super fun squabble uh, of wanting to be better than the disciples and have uh, no offense moms but it's kind of lame as mom comes up and says like Jesus Jesus you know can they sit at your right and your left and like mom get out of here uh, uh, but then Jesus says because to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant but it is for those whom it's been prepared by my father and when the other disciples when the ten heard of it they were indignant at James and John uh, but Jesus called, to the, called them all to me. He's like, come on, guys, huddle, get over here. Uh, it shall not, he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles uh, lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So true greatness uh, is found in the humble love and service of Jesus here. We see why uh, the Father loves his beloved Son and why he has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. Because through his humility on the cross, uh, which doesn't end there, even after the ascension, uh, Jesus' humble work continues today through the Holy Spirit in us 
uh, for our next point, that Jesus' power uh, will humble us too. Um, He's still actively at work in us to remove that false sense of greatness from us. And I love that statement because for the Christian in it, there is so much hope. Uh, Because of Jesus and our faith in his finished work, we can say, yes, God, I have. I have uh, used my power and influence that you've given me uh, to love and serve myself. I am sorry. I praise your name because I know that Jesus never did. Thank you for for your perfectly humble life, Christ, for loving me enough to pay the penalty for my sins. What love and service. And as 1 John 3.20 says, if our hearts condemn us, which they do, if we're honest, if we fall and pray to this power idol, because we have, we know that God is greater than our hearts. He overcame our sin once in our pride and salvation. He can do it again in sanctification. He will continue to humble us. He will make us content with our humble estate and our humble situations. He will give us joy and purpose in the common yet eternal work he's called us to. He will save us from accumulating power or using our brothers and sisters because he's faithful and because his words are both powerful and true. They're effectual and they make stuff happen. And for those of us who have given up and we have acknowledged uh, we are tired from seeking greatness in other places besides Christ, the Spirit is giving us, yes, that same mindset. Look at the Philippians 2 verse and back up two verses that says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, and have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And that verse really stuck with me because it reminds us that humility is also not just about like low self-esteem or low self-worth, but as C.S. Lewis puts it, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And remember the words of Jesus, how he said in Acts uh, 20 through Luke, he said, he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Or if we're looking at this lifestyle and how to inhabit it, we can look at 1 Peter 4 and say, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards, not owners of God's very grace. So with whatever abilities or powers or opportunities you've been given, Uh, As Galatians 5.14 says, do not use your freedom uh, as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Thanks, the Old Testament's long. (laughs) You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this is true greatness that we see here, and we are invited into to embrace. And lastly, in our last few minutes together, let's look at 2 Timothy 2, at a trustworthy and true saying. Because if we do model this humble service in life of Christ, it is by grace and no credit to our own that our final result uh, will be the same as Jesus' result for his humiliation. Honor and life and dominion with him forever. It says this saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he can't deny himself. And at that denial section, there is truth, uh, because it does stand as a warning for those of us who have not yet believed in the humble person and work of Christ, who are still denying his power and enjoying our own. And as John 5, 44 says, how can we believe if we accept glory from one another? Or do we forget what happened to King Herod in our Acts series, where it says in Acts 12, on that appointed day where Herod put on his royal robes and took a seat on his throne and delivered an oration to them. The people were shouting, the voice of God, not a man. And immediately uh, an angel of the Lord struck Herod down because he did not give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last bleh. Uh, or Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other. You see, humility is an inevitability. Uh, since Christ is coming to judge the world and us. And it does say at the, na- at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And there is a humility that leads to life. 
Uh, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you start in that place of confession and move to faith, you will be saved. And there is a humility that leads to death, to eternal separation from Christ, apart from anything good in this world. So, if his power will humble us one way or the other, we're begging you guys this morning to choose life. Hear the gospel invitation. It is good news. And cling to the humble person and work of Christ. Ask one of us. If you have questions, we'd love to talk about that with you. Or as 1 Peter um, 5, 4 through 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he will exalt you. And I want to be faithful in our closing moments together to my assignment in this series. I want to be helpful for those of you who are a little bit more logically minded and show you just one last image of uh, the two types of power in, that we've been talking about side by side. Maybe that the Spirit just might show us what an awful trade it can be uh, to keep glory and power for ourselves versus giving it away for Jesus, uh, for his kingdom, for his people. You see, we can either be lording what we think is our power or embracing Jesus' loving power in humility and through service. And our power, it has to be given to us, first of all. That's extremely humbling. And his has always existed for eternity. And our power, we have to keep and maintain. And his is fixed and permanent and steady as him. Our power is often a sham and a show when his is not. It is genuine and true. Uh, our power and our influence can be taken away instantly. But his will never be. And it's exhausting because there is no rest. There's constant management of trying to keep for ourselves. And in Jesus, there is rest when we take his yoke upon us. And our power is so temporary. His is eternal. Ours depends on our circumstances. His is on his nature and character. Our power has extreme limits and his has none. And regarding other people, it makes them feel used versus served. I mean, it becomes, because we're afraid of rivals and competition, we fear other people instead of loving other people. And it causes distance where instead of enjoying the, the grace of community and bringing other people to us, to each other, and to God, it brings humiliation ultimately and death. And the loving power of Jesus brings us honor and life. So to close, thank you guys for listening. I've enjoyed uh, just sharing some thoughts with you and opening the scriptures uh, let me ask you just a few questions, and I'll pray for us. Let's look at again at some of our first questions. That Are we using the power or influence, great or small, that God has given us to use people or to consume them or to take from them for our own good? Or like our Savior, are we giving our power and influence and resources away for the good of others and the glory of God? Think with me, if you have humbled yourself and confessed that you are not worthy of praise, you are not the Lord, you are not powerful enough to save your own soul uh, on the day that you come face to face with Jesus. And remember with me that far, far, far better than any false sense of greatness that comes by lording our power over others, true greatness is found, seen, can be treasured in the humble work and person Jesus, our Lord. So we beg you here today uh, to trust in him, to throw yourself upon the mercy of his cross, to lay any crowns you have taken up, down again. For whoever would save his life will lose it. In Matthew 16, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We love you, church. Let me pray for us. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness, not ours. We have all sought power, enjoyed our influence, pursued success. We're too hungry and eager for followers and praise. Forgive us. Give us through the humiliating and loving work of Jesus. Give us a heart of faith, even us Christians, to enjoy that humble work that you've assigned to us. And it is humble. It is not glorious. It does not seem that way, God, but help us delight in what you delight in 
and to be content with our humble estates. We need you this morning. We are a weak and needy people. Thank you, God, that you meet with us on Sundays as we gather. Thank you for our volunteers and deacons and elders who, who serve us here, the, who's, uh, the band whose instruments we're about to enjoy. God, we, we give you honor and praise and thanks. Help us to see our foolishness. We're reliant upon you for it. And we want to live for you. We want to see the great power of the gospel in our lives and in the people around us. We're thankful that power is as real as Christ in the heavens. And Lord, you perfect your power in our weakness. Please humble us this morning and draw our hearts and our souls to worship you as great. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen.